Wonderful students, welcome to asepsis and infection control. So we're going to look at the differences between um, all types of infections and what we as nurses do about that. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to review each one of these. If you can speak to these and apply these to your nursing practice, then you have accomplished your learning for this chapter. Components of the infection cycle are as follows. So we have an infection that is a disease state that results from the presence of what we call pathogens or disease producing microorganisms that occur in the body, right? That come into contact with the body. <clears throat> Excuse me. An infection occurs as, as a result of the cyclical process of being introduced to these different types of pathogens and will also involve six components. So the infection or cyclical process of the infection begins with the infectious agent. So the infectious, infectious agent is bacteria or viruses or parasites or fungi, all of the things that we come into contact with, um, you know, whether it's on a shopping cart or on a doorknob or a patient, right, or the counter or whatever that may look like. So we come into um, contact with these foreign bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, etc., and they're infectious agents, right? And then when they enter the body, they can actually alter and make us sick and cause disease, right? Next, we have a, <clears throat> a reservoir. So a reservoir is where the organism is going to grow, right? So the organism is going to grow and multiply in the natural habitat of the organism. That's called a reservoir. Possible reservoirs that support organisms' pathogenic growth um, in humans um, would, would be the human body, right? Or it could be animals. You know, pathogens grow in soil. Uh, they actually grow in food, water, milk. Um, like I mentioned before, fomites, F-O-M-I-T-E, which is like inanimate objects like desktops, right? Next is portal of exit. So the portal of exit is the point of escape for the organism from the reservoir. Let me say that again. The portal of exit is the point where the organism escapes from the reservoir, right? So the organism, organism cannot extends, extend its influence unless it moves away from its original reservoir, right? Each type of microorganism has a typical primary exit route. In humans, common portals of exit include our respiratory tract, our GI tract, right, our gastrointestinal tract. How about our genitory tracts, our um, blood, our tissues, um, but, and also our skin, right? Our skin's our largest organ that really protects us from all of these pathogens that can enter, right? <clears throat> Next on the list is means of transmission. So an organism may be transmitted from its reservoir by various means or routes. Some organisms can be transmitted by more than one route. Organisms can enter the, enter the body by way of contact transmission, either directly or indirectly. Direct contact transmission is when there's a close proximity and includes activities like touching, kissing, sexual intercourse, those kinds of things. And then with indirect contact, it involves personal contact with a vector, like I mentioned before. So it could be a living creature that transmits the infectious agents to us like a mosquito, or it could be a non-living um, a non-living creature like a fomite, right? Like a desktop or countertop, right? Portal of entry is the point at which organisms enter the new host. The entry route into the new host is often the same as the exit route from the prior reservoir. So the skin, urinary, respiratory tract, GI tract, GU tract are all common portals of entry. And then next on the list is a susceptible host. So microorganisms survive only in a source that provides shelter and nourishment. So that would be by the host, right? <clears throat> and only if the microorganisms overcome any resistance that's mounted by the host's defenses. 
So susceptibility is the degree of resistance the potential host has to the pathogen. So again, how susceptible you are to something is the degree to which you can provide a resistance to it, right? Um, to the pathogen itself. And then some examples of susceptible hosts are people with weakened immune systems, such as cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. Remember, when you're getting chemo, it doesn't just kill off the cancer cells, it actually kills off your healthy cells too, right? So patients who are on chemo, the thought process behind it is, will kill off all the cells in hopes that the body will only produce healthy cells, right? But what happens is, you know, you no longer have those white blood cells your your actual immune system to protect you so you can see why someone getting chemo could very easily be taken over by pathogens like bacteria viruses fungi parasites etc so here's the infection cycle it is demonstrated as a chain the goal is to break the links of the chain to end the cycle please note in the picture above that the links of the chain can be broken at any stage by using hand hygiene, by wearing gloves, by using masks, by using the appropriate uh, protective gear, by properly disposing of needles, by getting your immunizations, and the list goes on. <clears throat> hand hygiene, though, is a key component and is so extremely important um, as nurses to do frequently to ensure that we keep our patients safe from infections by breaking you know, that infection cycle. Here's infectious agents. So we have bacteria are the most significant and most common and honestly the most prevalent infectious agent that we see in the healthcare settings. Um, the classifications of bacteria, gram positive and gram negative are important to have a good general knowledge base um, since a lot of providers like doctors, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, all that, they utilize this information whether a bacteria is gram positive or gram negative when prescribing the most appropriate antibiotic therapy, right? So when you're talking to them, sometimes you do have discussions about that, so it's important to know. When wound cultures or blood cultures or even urine cultures come back, um, they're called into you as the RN, and the lab will describe the type of bacteria based on these characteristics, right? And it's the nurse's responsibility to call um, this result into the physician who ordered the tests, who will then make the best course of action based on this information. <clears throat> Viruses are the smallest microorganism that um, exist, and they're not treated with antibiotics, right? Antibiotics are not effective on viruses. With some viruses, if you catch it, if you know which virus and it's early enough in the cycle of the virus, there are a few or some antivirals that will work for that. But the caveat is it doesn't work for all viruses and you really have to catch it like within the first 24 to 48 hours for it to really make a difference, okay? Uh, but it always is, it's uh, beneficial to ask a doctor if your patient really is adamant to get a medication, right, and they have a virus. <clears throat> but please know, we'll not give them an antibiotic for a virus. Fungi are plant-like organisms, for, so for example, like mold or yeast, that can also be infections, right, like athlete's foot, what else, ringworm, yeast infections, all those kinds of things, right? And, and remember that fungi are present in the air, the soil, our water, like it's everywhere. Parasites are organisms that live on or in a host. So mosquitoes, ticks, all the disgusting things, right? <laughs> and they rely on the host for nourishment as well as um, that's how they pass on infections to the host when they bite them. It's so disgusting. <clears throat> Bacteria is classified based on their shape their response to gram staining, and their need for oxygen. So those are the three criteria that we um, classify bacteria on. There's no need to memorize that information. Um, just be well aware that, you know, have a general idea that we do classify them based on those three aspects, right? Because um, I'm not going to ask you a test question about, you know, the shape or the gram staining or any of that. Um, but however, you should be familiar with them and appreciate that there are millions of different types of bacteria classes and thus they can be really devastating at times, right? And difficult to diagnose. So, um, so yeah. Uh, pathogenic microbes challenge the immune system in many ways. Factors that can increase the chance of infection are as follows. 
the number of organisms, right? So as an increase in pathogens can overwhelm the body's immune defenses, you, if, if there are a larger number of organisms present, then it definitely will Im impact the patient, right? An example of this is when a patient contacts C. diff. Now, C. diff is a bacterium that causes severe diarrhea and inflammation of the colon and is usually seen when a patient's been on antibiotics for other illnesses and the antibiotics that they were on for their other illness has killed off all the good bacteria, right? So um, the good bacteria in your colon keeps out um, these troublemaker bacteria that causes C. diff, right? So again, many times after someone's been treated for a different infection, whether it's a UTI or pneumonia or whatever, that's usually when we'll see C. diff arise. And that's because um, they weren't on a probiotic to ensure, you know, that healthy bacteria stayed in the body and then and in the colon. <clears throat> in the hospital, we do give probiotics along with antibiotics. So that again, we're replacing the good bacteria in the colon so that that um, when the the antibiotics kill off the pneumonia or the UTI bacteria, it doesn't kill off the good bacteria in the colon, right? This replenishes what it's killing off, rather. Sorry. Um, the virulence factor, how strong is the virus? It's called the virulence factor. So, and that means how, how, uh, let's see how big of a disease or is the organism able to cause disease, right? So like COVID, right, was very virulent. It was very, very strong, right? And caused a lot of problems for a lot of people and killed a lot of like hundreds of thousands, millions of people, right? <clears throat> Worldwide. So um, let's see. Next is a person's immune system determines their susceptibility for infection. So it really does you know, when someone's immune system is compromised, then of course that's going to um, allow many more pathogens to enter the body and cause damage and harm to, to the body and organs, right? When the immune system is compromised, such as when it's already fighting a current illness, the immune response is reduced, leaving an opening for pathogens pathogens to multiply and cause disease. Time of exposure to the microorganism increases the risk of disease as well. During the COVID pandemic in the facility I worked at, we bundled care and tried to limit the amount of exposure that we as the staff, you know, when we were interacting with the patients with COVID, right, to try to prevent us from getting it. So the more you come into contact with these pathogens, the more likely you are going to catch it, right? So identification of infectious agents, right? So we have our endemic, which is a predictability of a specific region or population, right? Pandemic, that's when, that's what we had for COVID. And that's when there's actual a global, meaning worldwide outbreak of a new or not previously identified virus, right? And of course that happened with COVID. So again, here lists all of the things we just talked about, right? The pathogen, reservoir, portal of um, exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, and then your susceptible host, right? Um, so again, common reservoirs are other people, animals, soil, food, water, milk, and then inanimate objects, which we also call fomite. Portals of exit is, how does it get out of your body? Well, through the respiratory tract, the GI tract, the GU tract, breaks in your skin, and of course, through blood and tissues. Means of transmission. So the term modes of transmission refers to how an infectious, infectious agent, also called a pathogen, can be transferred from one person, object, or animal to another. Direct um, mode of transmission involves direct body surface to body surface contact and physically transfer of microorganisms between an infected person or even a colonized person to another person or um, by touch. So again, you either have an infected person that's transmitting that pathogen to another person by touch or you have a person who has um, the colonized pathogen in their body where for that ex you know for that example when you have colonized pathogen in your body it doesn't make you sick right because it's colonized it's it's 
encapsulated in your body, right? So it's not causing you an, an illness, but in fact, you are still contagious to other people, right? You, a colonized person uh, can transmit their infection to another person, right? And, and through touch. And we'll discuss this more in class. Indirect will involve contact between the person and a contaminated object, right? This is often a result of unclean hands, almost always, contaminating contaminating an object or environment. For example, uh, has I last weekend I saw a nurse walk out with a urine specimen <clears throat> before and she didn't put it in the bag instead she walked up to the front desk where uh, we all walk up and put our arms and hands and chart and all that and she put that urine specimen right up on the countertop oh uh, yeah um okay vector borne diseases result from an infection transmitted to humans and other animals by blood feeding anthropods those disgusting mosquitoes ticks fleas they're all gross right so that's a vector borne disease um, so that may be dengue fever west nile virus lyme disease malaria all of these would be examples right Ugh. fomites are exposure um, to secondary routes of exposure like oral direct contact from a pathogen and they enter the host right again it could be that fomite could be a desktop right and um, so again it could be vehicles or it could be shovels or clothing or bowls or buckets or brushes or clippers or again desktops all of those things right stages of infection okay the incubation period is the interval between the pathogen's invasion of the body and the appearance of symptoms of infection. During this stage, the organisms are growing and multiplying. The length of incubation may vary. A person is most infectious during the prodormal stage. Early signs and symptoms of disease are present, but these are often vague and nonspecific. It could be anything from, you know, from fatigue to malaise to low-grade fever. So you can see how many times people aren't even aware that they're sick, right? This period can last from for several hours to several days. During this phase, the patient is often unaware of being contagious. As a result, the infection spreads pretty easily to other people and hosts. Remember, this is the most infectious time. The presence of infection, specific signs and symptoms, indicates the full stage of illness. Let me repeat that. The presence of infection, specific signs and symptoms, indicates the full stage of illness. The type of infection determines the length of the illness and the severity of its manifestations. Symptoms that are limited or occur in only one body area are referred to as localized symptoms, whereas symptoms manifested throughout the entire body are referred to as systemic systems. The convalescent period is the recovery phase. This is dependent upon the severity of the infection and the patient's condition. Inflammatory response helps the body neutralize, control, or eliminate the offending agent or pathogen, and it also helps start to prepare the site for repair. Um, the inflammatory response occurs in response to infection or injury. So literally, anytime you injure yourself or you are exposed to a pathogen, inflammation occurs at that site, right? So you get the redness, the swelling, um, warmth, all of that, right? It can be acute or chronic, right? And when you are entering the vascular phase of inflammatory response, this is when vasodilatation occurs, which will increase the blood flow to the area. That's what's resulting in the redness and the heat and the warmth, right? And the swelling. Histamine is released at this time and it causes permeability of the vessels and it also causes protein-rich fluid to get um, to the, go to the site of the injury. So that, again, that's the cause of the swelling. It can be cause for the pain as well as loss of function to that site, right? And then we have the cellular stage of the cycle or the cellular phase. And that's when the white blood cells, leukocytes, right? And specifically neutrophils, which is the number one, um, the most 
uh, type of white blood cells are neutrophils, right? And neutrophils are typically elevated when you have a bacterial infection. So you have the cellular stage and leukocytes and neutrophils go to the area and they will consume debris in the area. They'll eat up all the damaged cells, right? And then they'll start to re repair the damaged cells. So then we have our immune response again, right? So our, again, our body's um, immune response is its way of protecting and defending itself against all of these different pathogens, right? We have two different types of immune response in the body, right? Humoral immunity and what we call cell mediated immunity. Now, a lot of this is gonna be reviewed from anatomy and physiology. So if you already know this, you could probably fast forward. If you don't, then definitely keep listening. Okay, hum humoral immunity is when there is an antigen foreign material bacteria, for example, that comes into the body. So you get you have this um, pathogen that enters the body through the broken skin or however it enters, right? And then your body recognizes this pathogen as foreign, and it rep and it will. Uh, produce a copy of this antigen and this copy of the antigen is called an antibody right so this antibody exists in the body moving forward so that if this individual is ever um is, if this individual that has this antibody in it is ever again comes into contact with that specific pathogen, it won't impact the patient as much because it has antibodies that can attach to the receptor sites and, and in effect make them a moot point, right? It won't be able to hurt the body. So that's what's really cool about humoral immunity. Again, it makes a copy of the virus that floats around in the body so that you have this humoral immunity just existing waiting for you to ever get exposed to that exact pathogen again. And if you are, then what's cool about the antibody is it attaches to the receptor sites, right? Is this coming, does this coming back to you? Um, and then second is the cell mediated immunity. Now this is where as a result of exposure to these pathogens, you have an increase in your lymphocytes that will literally destroy or react with cells um, that the body recognize as harmful, right? So again, cell, medi cell mediated immunity will result in the increase in lymphocytes that destroy or react with cells that the body recognizes as harmful, okay? So one, humoral will produce a copy of the pathogen, or two, it will literally destroy the pathogen itself. Okay, factors that affect the host susceptibility. Uh, factors that may affect an individual's risk for infection are listed here. The body's defense mechanisms against disease protect the body from pathogen, you know, pathogens invade, invading us, right? And um, any breakdown in our body's immune system and our immune defenses makes the individual much more susceptible to infection, right? General health status plays a large part in susceptibility, as well as does stress and fatigue. That puts our immune system automatically in a weakened state. So you can see how having, you know, a stressful life, stressful job, all of these things can literally make you more susceptible to pathogens infecting, affecting you, right? All lines, all tubes, all drains that we put as nurses or doctors in the body increase the risks of infection as they introduce the possibility of these pathogens entering the body, right? So anytime we place an IV or a drain or um, a chest tube, all of these things, right, increase the potential for infection to happen. Healthy habits that promote wellness can reduce potential risk factors, thus decreasing the susceptibility of a host. So that's why we're going to talk about wellness, wellness, lots of wellness with our patients, right? Eating healthy, work, you know, working out, you know, getting your vaccinations, all of these things put you at a much higher risk, a much higher, not risk, but a much higher uh, protection against pos possible pathogens. Okay, laboratory data that would indicate a possible infection, right? Again, your white blood cells protect the body against foreign pathogens. So when there's an elevation in a white blood cell um, or your lymphocytes, then you will know that you most likely have some sort of an infection or a reaction in the body, right? So again, increase 
we're going to talk when we get into um, talking about fluid and electrolytes and uh, acid base balances, we're going to discuss the different types of white blood cells and how um, each of those, when elevated, could be indicative of a certain type of infection. For example, example, neutrophils, again, are typically bacterial infections, right? So the majority of neutrophils, when they're elevated, indicate that the patient has some type of bacterial infection, right? Um, another of the white blood cells, we have monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and neutrophils. Your basophils, for example, just a second example of your white blood cells, they are elevated when you have an allergic response in the body. So somebody who has um, as uh, status asthmaticus, which is a um, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction where you can actually die from this type of um, severe asthmatic attack, would your body would produce basophils in that situation, right? So those would be significantly elevated. Um, so it tells you a lot, right? The type of white blood cells that are elevated will tell you a lot about the infection that's, and it gives us a starting point, you know, to follow up with the doctor. Hey, you know, this patient's neutrophils um, are elevated or we'll say, if, if the neutrophils are what elevated, we'll call it a left shift. You're gonna learn more about what is a left shift in block two. And we'll also talk about the left shift when we talk about the immune system uh, and white blood cells late, much later on in black one. You might see presence of pathogens in your urine, blood, sputum, uh, draining cultures, wound cultures, all kinds of things, okay? Outcome identification and planning infection control. Listed here are some planning or interventions that we as the nurse can implement to keep our patients safe from infections. Good hygiene practices are a very, very high priority. We have teams in the hospital that elevate our hand hygiene um, practices. They also go around and they will literally evaluate us. And many times they'll do this without even letting us know, right? They recruit other people to come in and, and just watch individuals and do, um, you know, evaluate whether or not people are um, washing in and out of the rooms, right? Um, because it's really important that we protect our patients and ourselves by doing hand hygiene. We receive scores yearly regarding each institution's hand hygiene compliance, right? And we do look at that. It's one of the factors that's uh, regulated by the regulating agencies that come in, JCO and all of them. Recognizing the signs and symptoms of infection is extremely important to teach your patients at discharges. This can help reduce complications as well as readmissions to the hospital. It's important as a nurse to teach your patient all of these signs and um, symptoms again before discharge. You also want to teach them about nutrition, uh, cleanliness, disinfection practices, um, how to avoid infections how important it is for them to get their immunizations, um, how important it is to learn how to reduce stress, um, all again to help protect the immune system and to keep it strong. Uh, so please see your book for practicing basic principles of medical asepsis in patient care. Okay, what are the cardinal signs of an acute infection? Redness, heat, swelling, pain, or even possible loss of function at the site. Um, and also remember the addition of possible fever, chills, could be new onset of cough or shortness of breath, could be congestion, vomiting, diarrhea. All of these could be signs of an infection starting. An elevation in white blood cell count on a laboratory report can be a sign of a systemic infection. Please see the book again for laboratory data indicating an infection for the different types based on the white blood cell um, elevation, right? So again, we just talked about it. Different types of white blood cells get elevated with different types of infections or exposures. Please know those. You will see them on NCLEX, HESI, in your exams. Um, cultures are done on blood, urine, sputum, wounds, all of these things to 
determine what specific pathogen is infected in that area. That way we can narrow down which antibiotics will work for those different types of pathogens, right? So that's why we do cultures. And it's extremely important that you actually get a culture before you hang the antibiotics for the patient. If you forget to do that, we will not be able to tell whether or not um, we have the right pathogen, right? Because the antibiotics may start working. So again, just make sure you get a culture before you hang, hang any antibiotics. So um, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Yeah. Five, mo five moments for hand hygiene per the World Health Organization, okay? So this slide provides guidelines for when, it, when the bare minimum to perform hand hygiene. In addition to this guide, remember, to alcohol in and out of every patient room, right? But you definitely want to wash your hands with actual soap and water uh, before a clean procedure or before an aseptic procedure. I also wash my hands with soap and water whenever I touch a patient on isolation precautions, right? Because you just never know. Uh, general rule of thumb is if there is ever a question in your mind, just wash your hands. You cannot wash them too much when working with patients or really with the public in any way. We will get to practice this activity, proper hand washing in the lab. Bacterial bacterial flora. Um, please see the book for bacteria flora as a description of transient and res, uh, resident bacteria. It goes through the difference between the two. Also be sure to read the information on concept mastery alert regarding alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Remember the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers will not kill the spores of C. diff, right? Therefore you must scrub your hands with soap and water with these patients for a minimum of 20 seconds at a time, right? Scrub, scrub, scrub. It's not just the soap, but the friction um, of you washing that gets uh, kills the spores of the C. diff. Hospital acquired infections or HAIs are major challenges for our healthcare providers. In the United States, HAIs account for tens of thousands of deaths and about 33 billion of additional health care costs annually. It's insane. Um, the cost of additional health uh, hospital care days in order to treat HAIs is staggering, uh, particularly in the light of the efforts to control spiraling health care expenses, right? They just get worse and worse. With its focus on patient safety, the Joint Commission mandated that death or serious injury caused by an infection related event must be reported as a sentinel event okay many of these infections are considered never events meaning medicare says these should never occur hospital acquired infections and if they do then we are not going to reimburse you for you having to treat the patient for that so they we won't get paid for the rehospitalizations if the the infection that they come back in is due to the fact that we weren't doing great hand hygiene or, or they were introduced to an you know a different bacteria um, while in the hospital right a different pathogen i should say not just bacteria um, because these infections are considered preventable right they shouldn't have picked up another infection we should have did better control of our um, ability to not transfer infections from one patient to the next, right? The four sources for infection listed on this slide are responsible for the majority of HAIs in the um, acute care setting, the hospital setting, right? Infection control measures include adherence to recommended best practices or bundling care. Bundles are evidence based practices that have prov proven positive outcomes when implemented together to prevent infection. Initiatives to prevent CAUTI or catheter associated urinary tract infections, that's a CAUTI. So CAUTI outlines three areas of focus. So we want to prevent uh, inappropriate short term urinary catheter use timely removal of catheters and we as nurses drive that as well as catheter care uh, during placement right so making sure that we place our Foley catheters with sterile technique 
focused initiatives like this one from the ANA have resulted in really great progress, right? However, 6% increases in CAUTI was reported between 2009 and 2013, indicating that we have a much more need to uh, go back to focusing on being very, very careful when we, when we put Foley's in, right? Because we don't want to introduce these uh, infections in the into the urinary tract. Um, these are issues in the hospital. Many initiatives are, are put in place to try to decrease these infections. Again, like use of aseptic techniques or maybe even use of two two person assist, those kinds of things, right? Um, but it's just important to remember that we have to always in the forefront, no matter, no matter how many patients, if we have six patients that day or 30 patients, if you're in a skilled nursing facility, you know, you got to maintain um, a sepsis so that we do not introduce these healthcare um, acquired infections to them. Okay, vancal resistant enterococci. So VRE, what are the risk factors for you, for VRE? First of all, VRE is a serious pathogen in our hospitals and sometimes found in the sniffs and owls, right? It is found in the normal intestine and our GU genitory tracts as well. However, it can cause HAIs with a high mortality rate if the organism is vancomycin resistant. So risk factors for VRE are similar to other healthcare associated um, infections and include patients who have compromised immune systems or patients who have recent surgeries or maybe patients who had invasive devices put in, maybe they've been on prolonged antibiotic use, especially vancomycin, or even if they've been prolonged you know, hospitalization. VRE is spread via contact with feces, with urine, or blood of an infected person or a colonized person, right? Could come from a colonized person. Healthcare providers must work to ensure prompt recognition, prompt diagnoses, prompt isolating that patient, prompt management of that infection, and prompt control of that infection, right? It's our job. Nursing assessment, our interventions, and our evaluations of high-risk patients and high-risk situations helps to minimize the infection rate and also reduces the unnecessary suffering of the patients who potentially could get this, right? Uh, so we have Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, is responsible for an estimated 20,000 deaths annually in the United States and is associated with an increase in hospitalization stays be anywhere between three to six days. This infection costs the healthcare system billions with a B of dollars each year. C. diff is a bacterium that can cause symptoms ranging from diarrhea to life-threatening inflammation of the colon. Illness, most commonly affecting older adults, um, it can also, though, affect persons of any age, right? It does affect the, the elderly more, many times because they're already predisposed uh, to other um, pathogens, right? And are therefore on, on antibiotics, which, of course, kills off healthy bacteria, which, in fact, is how C. Div takes over the colon, right, and causes all these problems. So you can see how, how the uh, pathway happens, right? But remember, it can affect patients of any age, right? Uh, whether they're in long-term care, the hospital, at home, all of these things, right? Um, and it, and it, again, it typically occurs after the use of antibiotic therapy for some other infection, thus leading to uh, C. difficile. In the hospital, patients suspected of or having tested positive for C. diff are immediately placed on contact isolation precautions. Everyone that presents with loose, watery stools are tested for C. diff. It is very important to wash your hands with soap and water again when caring for these patients as the alcohol-based hand sanitizers will not kill the spores of the C. difficile. Other ways we are combating this infection in the hospital is giving probiotics to patients who are on antibiotic therapy, right? Um, because again, C. diff occurs due to 
the antibiotics killing off the healthy normal flora in your colon, right? So we want to replenish that so you don't get C. diff. So if you ever go on an antibiotic or your patient does, I always ask my daughter for a uh, doctor for a probiotic. And yeah, some doctors give it to you like no problem. Others will give you a hard time. But guess what? So what? Ask them anyway. And I just tell them, yeah, yeah, give it to me and I'll leave you alone. And they usually do. <laughs> um, okay. Another thing that we might do for somebody who has C. diff, we'll do what's called fecal transplants, right? And we do those, the RN does, um, on the floor. We no longer need doctors to perform these procedures because um, um, we can give them rectally through an enema. And this slide and the next one provides good information on how to prevent, prevent C. diff. So please pause the video and read through it because I guarantee you're going to see C. diff on a lot of your tests, okay? So again, pause the video, read through the slide. Okay, factors determining use of sterilization and disinfection methods. Okay, cleansing, disinfection, and sterilization all help to break the cycle of infection and prevent disease. Several processes are used to destroy microorganisms. Disinfection destroys all pathogenic organisms except spores. Sterilization destroys all microorganisms, including spores. Disinfection can be used when preparing the skin for a procedure or cleaning a piece of equipment that does not enter a sterile body part. Sterilization is usually performed on equipment that is, um, that is entering a sterile portion of the body. Disinfection and sterilization of contaminated or infected objects and good hand hygiene diminish and often eliminate microorganisms as potential sources of infection. So this is one thing that we can do, these three, right, that can help minimize or diminish or lower the potential problems that these pathogens can cause. Listed here are some factors that determine the use of sterilization or disinfection. And also, please look at your book because they have some really good um, information on sterilization and disinfection. PPE or personal protective equipment and supplies, right? So this slide lists types of personal protective equipment. Um, we will get to practice putting on and removing PPE in lab and probably in class. Proper use of PPE helps protect the healthcare uh, professionals and the patients from pathogen exposure, right? Gloves are not a suitable, um, let me repeat that. Gloves are not a substitute for good hand hygiene. They are worn only once and they're discarded appropriately according to the facility policy. Then hands are thoroughly de decontaminated with meticulous hand hygiene. When nursing care activities do not involve the possibility of soiling the hands with bodily fluids, gloves are not necessary. So for example, when you give a patient a, a PO, PO by mouth pill medication, you do not need to put gloves on. You're not going to come into bodily fluids, right? It's not like you're sticking it in her mouth. You're going to be potentially getting saliva and she might bite you and all those things, right? No, it's not going to happen. So again, you don't need um, gloves on if you're not coming into uh, contact with bodily fluids. Gowns are worn to protect the healthcare worker from blood or bodily fluids getting on your clothing, um, which of course could be tracked into another patient's room, you know, if, if you got it on your clothes. Therefore, contact isolation room gowns are required PPE. Masks help prevent the wearer from inhaling large particles, aerosols, that travel short distances like three feet, right? Small particles they, that hang out in the air can travel longer distances. So keep that in mind, right? We're talking about particles that travel in the air. Larger particles can only go about three feet, whereas smaller particles can last in the air for a long time and can go much, much further distances. Masks also protect the patient from respiratory secret, uh, secretions of the healthcare worker, right? Because remember, you in the prodromal state, you're you could be sick and not even be aware, right? Because you have such vague symptoms like fatigue. So uh, nurses could be ill, but if a patient wears a mask, then we could potentially protect them there too. A respirator, a specific type of mask, filters inspired air. Surgical masks filter 
only expired air. A mask is worn in droplet isolation rooms. Recently, with the COVID pandemic, the new guidelines require wearing a mask use 100% of the time on the shift, or you saw that, I should say, during the COVID pandemic. We have now, though, almost everywhere gotten to where we no longer are following the um, masks around the clock any, anymore at, at the hospital or even the facilities. About a year ago, Mission Palms, um, you know, stopped requiring it. So many of the places don't require it anymore. Um, due to COVID. What else? One of the most commonly used masks is the N95 respirator, and it's designed to filter out particles as small as one MCM, like teeny, teeny, tiny, with 95% efficacy. And it is fit tested to the individu individual, right? So you have to be specially fit tested for these. And therefore, they fit really securely against the face, right? Um, the elastic straps on these respirators provide more protection and a better fit than ties on regular surgical masks, right? Um, and N95 masks are worn in airborne isolation rooms, such as a patient who has TB. Um, and then we even used it, you know, during the COVID pandemic when there are people dying from it. Um, protective eyewear protects the mucous membranes from contamination. So here's a picture of the N95 particulate respirator. Okay, standard precautions. So again, precautions may have changed due to COVID, but we're all back to the regular precautions, right? So standard precautions would not be a mask in every room anymore, right? Maybe during COVID we had a mask in every room, but that is not the case any longer, right? So it is important that you understand the different types of precautions and what PPE goes with them, right? Um, so we use standard precautions with all patients, regardless of diagnoses, regardless of possible infection status, um, and it applies to all bodily fluids and excretions, right? So basically, standard precaution says you utilize the uh, most needed, consistent, effective approach to inf infection control. Utilizing standard precautions like washing your hands, putting on gloves if you're going to come into with into uh, if you're going to become into contact with blood or bodily fluids, right? Putting on a mask if you're going to come into contact with droplet precautions, all of these things, right? Transmission-based precautions have additional PPE requirements depending upon the type of precaution. The three types of transmission-based precautions include airborne, droplet or contact and then again you do need you do want to look at the book right it has lists and examples of these three different types of transmission based precautions so look at that because they give some pretty good examples in there okay aseptic technique includes all activities to prevent or break the chain of infection remember back to that slide earlier where we had the circle and the way you could break was by washing your hands or getting immunizations and all that stuff right so look back in your book again that talks about the basic principles of surgical apes asepsis um, and it also talks about you know sterile field how to add items to a sterile field so look through that of course we're going to be performing and practicing these skills in lab you know we use both clean technique as well as sterile technique to break the the cycle of infection um, and to protect the patient, right? So clean technique literally involves use of clean procedure filled, clean gloves um, with sterile supplies and avoidance of any direct contamination of the materials or supplies we're using. Whereas sterile technique involves the use of sterile procedure filled, sterile gloves and sterile supplies. So it's important when performing a sterile procedure to not break sterile field. And we are going to cover this pretty heavily when we do Foley. It is a sterile procedure, right? So we'll teach you how to do that and then we'll practice together before your checkoffs. Um, 
when we can, we, we do like to take two RNs into the room to perform a sterile field like when we do Foley's, right? This way, the one RN can, you know, clean the hands and the other can remain sterile. Um, additionally, there is another set of eyes that can help watch to make sure we don't break sterile field, right? Meticulous hand uh, washing is required for both. Okay, so surgical asepsis is different. So surgical asepsis is used for the operating room, uh, labor and delivery areas, uh, certain diagnostic testing areas, and um, we have st sterile technique as well that we use at the patient's bedside. Procedures done bedside that require sterile technique uh, are indwelling catheters, central line dressing changes, uh, when we access patients' implanted ports in their chest, all kinds of things, right? Those are just a few examples. So again, uh, look at the book. They have great examples. Let's see here. Um, next is, as RNs, it is our primary responsibility to teach our patients ways to reduce their risk for infection. This slide provides great examples of the type of teaching performed before discharge, right? So pause it and take a look because it's really good. More specific teaching may be required. As an example, if the patient is going home and will need to perform their own dressing change, they will need to be taught how to properly change that dressing. A great teaching method is the watch one, do one, teach one, right? The patient watches the nurse change the dressing, then the patient does the dressing change themselves with the RN, and the next time the patient does the dressing change, they teach the RN how they are going to change the dressing. So then we can actually see, are they really getting every single step, right? It's a great way. The teach back method is a great way to evaluate um, the patient's understanding and their learning, as well as help to identify areas where there may need to be additional education given to the patient. All right. Okay, I think this uh, concludes the chapter on asepsis and infection control. And again, you'll want to listen to this chapter like all the others a couple, a couple times and take really good notes, right? Have your books open too when you're doing it. All right, guys. See you in class.